Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to uh, this month's Health Tech Entrepreneurs Meetup. Um, so I'm recording now. Um, so today we have Scott Talbot and Jeremy Binstock of Cooley LLP, and they are going to be talking about uh, patenting medical devices and common mistakes we should avoid. Um, so as a reminder, this is a space where we can learn how to apply concepts from all these webinars and seminars we're learning to real life. So it's a chance for everyone to uh, discuss their own experiences and share tips and advice. Um, so if there's something that you'd like to hear about, um, or if you'd like to speak at a future meetup, let me know. Uh, keep sending me uh, keep sending me feedback. Uh, we also have a Slack workspace and a mailing list uh, for our startup studio, the MDC studio. So let me know if you'd like to join. Um, so I'd also like to thank our sponsors. I'm gonna share a slide. So yes, thank you to our sponsors, uh, Tedco, uh, Cooley, thank you, uh, you'll hear from them today, uh, and Fulton Bank, and of, of course, uh, the MDC studio. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. So we can do our, let's do our usual uh, introduction. Um, so I'm gonna go down the list on my right. So if I call your name and you'd like to introduce yourself, please unmute and let us know who you are, what you're working on, um, if you're looking for any help or if you can offer any help. So I can get started. Hi, I'm Neo. I'm the founder and CEO of Neurosonics Medical. We're developing a novel therapeutic ultrasound device for minimally invasive neurosurgery. I'm also the vice president of business development at the MDC studio. Uh, we are a startup studio dedicated to building health and medical technology companies. So let us know um, if you'd like to chat with us. I also recently started as a senior analyst at the MDC Verte Impact Fund, uh, which is a new venture fund investing in medical and biotech companies located in, in federally designated opportunity zones. So I uh, thanks for thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm gonna skip Jeremy and Scott because the, uh, they can introduce themselves later. Um, all right, Linda. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, thanks. Sorry, I uh, messed up the time, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, are we just doing introductions? Yep, just intros. Uh, let us know who you are, what you're working on. Sure. My name is Linda. I'm at a really small startup in Baltimore, Maryland called Malcova, and we are working on developing um, new a new type of uh, medical device um, specifically for breast cancer screening. And in the future, we hope to expand to other body parts. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Abraham? Yes. Hi, my name is Abraham. I am currently the um, uh, medical Sciences Innovator Leader at Cosmos Medical LLC. It is a startup that uh, was raised here at John Hopkins Hospital and John Hopkins University. I currently founded it with my, my wife. She's a medical doctor at John Hopkins and we filed for a patent with the USPTO about three years ago. And currently we are hopefully trying to get an answer from the office, but due to COVID events is taking there's a lag behind the, the patent. Uh, but yeah, we are trying to develop, we are developing new technologies for uh, incubators for ba premature babies. So babies that are born premature in the NICU units, neonatal intensive care units. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Gary? Sure, Gary Fletcher. Uh, I have my own uh, consulting practice. I've spent most of my career in medical device uh, product development, research and development, PhD in physics, uh, spent a lot of time in mechanical engineering, currently involved in a startup that's involved in uh, developing a new kind of immunomagnetic cell separation technology for cell therapy applications. And uh, the other hat I wear is as a consultant in, to med device companies and also as an expert witness in medical device patent litigation. Uh, cases. So that's me. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Hamid? All right, skip Hamid. Uh, Jason? All right, we'll skip Jason. Uh, John? Naveed? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Naveed Google. I am a CEO and founder of a startup called Yektosonics. We develop a therapeutic ultrasound phased array 
for medical uh, focus ultrasound applications. So that's pretty much what we do. And uh, yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, Peter? Hi, um, I'm a recent um, graduate of uh, Princeton University, chemical and biological engineering. Um, and then I'm now a, a law student up in Boston. And um, so I'm just here to, to listen. I'm interested in practicing in this area at some point. So I'm, I'm here to just, just listen and learn. Awesome, welcome. Uh, Seema? Hi, I'm not on the entrepreneur side. I'm with Cooley. So I'm just here to listen in. Hi, everyone. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Wayne? Good afternoon, Wayne Sternberger. I'm from Block Synop Incorporated. After 40 years at Johns Hopkins APL and School of Medicine, I co-founded and am CTO of the company Block Synop, and we are commercializing a novel patient monitor that allows clinicians to quantitatively, objectively, and in real time measure and identify neural blockades. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Zubair? Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is Zubair and I am a uh, student currently, an undergrad student uh, at the University of Ottawa up north in Canada, just finishing my final year. Uh, apart from that, I'm a student researcher at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute in clinical epidemiology. Not currently a part of any startups, but uh, I'm here to listen in and uh, because at some point I think I would like to dive into this industry. So just here to, to see what everybody is up to and just get a feel for how the industry is. Awesome, welcome. Um, Emma? All right. Um, anyone else uh, that I miss who would like to introduce themselves? All right, I will hand it off to Jeremy and Scott. Um, I'm gonna, Jeremy, I can make you the host so you can share. Sure, it looks like I have rights. I can oh, okay, go ahead and share. All right, so while he's getting that up, um, I wanted to introduce Scott Talbot, who is a partner, and Jeremy Binstock, who is an associate at Cooley LLP. Um, so they have, uh, it's so good. They have extensive experience uh, working with clients with innovative technologies, and, and they also provide strategic patent counseling. So um, IP is, an, is a critical asset, as I'm sure you all know, uh, for med tech companies that need that need to be needs to be protected. Um, so they're going to go over some important legal concepts that medical device companies should be thinking about uh, even from early on, including common mistakes that they see from entrepreneurs in this space. So I will hand it to uh, Scott and Jeremy now. myself. There we go. Hello, everybody. Um, glad to have this opportunity to, to talk to you all. Um, we, we, we spend or I spend most of my time in Germany as well working with early stage companies and entrepreneurs. It's it, we get excited to work with uh, with companies at that stage. So always delighted to, to have an opportunity to, uh, to help guide counsel, uh, educate uh, people on the on the patent aspects of their programs. Um, uh, just my personal background, aerospace engineer, worked in industry for a while, been in law for 35 years now, I guess, uh, yeah, going on 35 years, a couple of years as corporate before I found uh, my passion in patent law, uh, spend 75% of my time working in med tech um, and, and typically medical device. Um, Jeremy's got on the slide here, just a representative list of companies that he and I have actually worked on together. These are all in the cardiac space, um, it, but they're, they're kind of representative of some of the things that we do. And as you can see there, most of them are, are uh, spin outs of, of some flavor of universities, Baylor, Rice, uh, UMB, close to home, University of Iowa. Um, uh, and, and so we'll, I think this, this deck will be available um, ultimately, so those hyper hyperlinks may be useful to the extent you find any of those companies interesting. And, and part of what we, part of the selection there was also just to note, you, you'll see a lot of them have links to press releases about their exits uh, that they made. So that's why uh, we get very jazzed when we can start with somebody very early stage, take them all the way through the process. And ultimately, uh, for most, most med tech companies, their goal is to be acquired by a strategic. And so we've been through, been down that path a lot of times and uh, get very excited from that. I was actually just in New York last night doing a closing dinner on that last one with Fair Pulse um, that just got acquired by Boston Scientific. Um, so that's me. I'll let Jeremy introduce himself. 
Sure, it's great to meet everybody here uh, via Zoom. Thanks for having us. Um, so my background is in mechanical engineering. I worked as a mechanical systems engineer at Siemens for about four or five years, um, designing steam turbine power, uh, power plant systems, and then took off for law school, joined Cooley shortly uh, thereafter, after my first year, and I've been here about eight years. Um, and my practice is very much similar to Scott's. As he mentioned, we work mostly with early stage companies. Um, I'd say 80% of my practice of those early stage companies is, is on MedTech. Scott's is probably up there as well. Um, so MedTech is, I think, speak for both of us, is, is really sort of our bread and butter area, um, an area we're, we're passionate about. And we, we love working with those types of inventors and, and docs and, and stuff of that nature. So again, that, that's my background. Happy to be here. Um, looking forward to, to a healthy discussion. And go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, so, so Jeremy's gonna do, do the presentation. I'll, I'll chime in if I think uh, there's an additional point worth making. We very much welcome in these sorts of presentations to not to have them be one way. So please feel free at any point. If you got a question, you know, raise a hand, do a chat message or, or just chime in. Uh, we're happy to amplify at any point. Uh, it's, it's always hard to gauge, you know, the right, pay, the right pace to go, how much to dwell on particular topics versus sort of skimming quickly through. Uh, so we'll probably default a little bit to, to going relatively more quickly through through basics, but, you know, we do, part of this is educational. So if there's anything you would like to say, hold on, can you stop, explain that again? Uh, don't hesitate. We're happy to, happy to do that. And then, of course, questions at the end as well. Definitely. Feel free to interrupt and hopefully we'll have some, some time for Q&A at the end. Um, and I think, as now mentioned, this was sort of, topic was sort of uh, mistakes to avoid. I like to be a little more sort of positive and optimistic. So all, all of this that we're gonna cover is sort of based on our, our learnings from, from mistakes that, that we've seen. Um, and hopefully we can, we can prevent some of that uh, by, by going over it. So here's a summary of what we'll cover. Um, top patent rights, patentability and freedom to operate or FTO. I see a lot of confusion between these concepts, and so I thought it might be helpful to start with a short high-level overview uh, of each of these and, and the interplay between them. Then we'll dive into IP ownership, and not the most exciting topic, but probably one of the most important and where we see uh, a lot of the issues, especially when dealing with clients who are sort of spin-outs from, from universities and, and hospital systems and the like, um, making sure IP ownership is shored up and, and we know who owns what. Um, and, and it'll inevitably be a major topic, um, with med tech companies when, when trying to strike any type of deal, you know, with raising money, um, or all the way to, all the way to exit, it'll, it'll be a hot topic. So it's important to, to get that done early and often, um, or, or to stay on top of it at least. So then we'll turn to pursuing patent protection, um, and some strategies on when file, where to file, how to file, um, drafting strategies, stuff of that nature. and then. We'll finish up with some, uh, some sort of high level concrete steps uh, that we think medical device entrepreneurs uh, can take away from this discussion today. All right. What is a patent? I mean, all of you can probably already present the slide yourselves, but I'll run through it quickly. Nonetheless, uh, government granted monopoly based on an invention and a patent allow, what does it allow you to do? It allows a patent owner to prevent anyone else from making, using, selling, or even offering to sell a product or use a method covered by the patent. And the operative word here is, is in bold and underlined. It allows you to prevent. So we'll get in more detail later. It doesn't allow you to actually do something um, or to, to make or use your invention. It just allows you to prevent others from doing so. Patents are territorial. So a US patent only covers uh, the US. Um, European patent covers Europe and so on and so forth. Patents are time limited. The, the life of a patent is 20 years from the filing date with some, some exceptions that we'll get into later. Um, and keep in mind that a competitor infringes even if they reverse, so a competitor would infringe your patent even if they reverse engineer or ind independently develop the invention. Um, and that, that's contrary to, to a trade secret. Protecting your technology. As I mentioned before, a patent is not a right to practice the subject invention. Right? It's really just a manner to prevent others from doing so. An invention can be patent. This is an important point that I think is lost on many. An invention can be a patentable improvement over an earlier patent, but still be infringing the earlier patent. And, and that's sort of where you get into the difference between patentability and freedom to operate. 
um, which are separate but overlapping analyses. And, and I'll take you through sort of a quick stool chair analogy to hopefully bring this home. Um, so let's say we're back in the 17th century. I have this great idea that I wanna be able to sit up off the ground. So I invent the stool, right? And I file a patent application and get an issued patent that claims a stool, four legs and a seat coupled to that stool. I'm sorry, coupled to the, to the legs. Um, I can now prevent others from making, using, selling or offering to sell a stool, right? Four legs and a seat. Then Scott comes around, decides, you know, sitting on my stool hurts his back. So he decided he designs a stool with a backrest, calls it a chair, files a patent application, obtains an issued patent uh, that claims four legs and a seat coupled to the four legs, right? Just like my invention, but he adds a backrest coupled to the seat. Patent office says, you know, adding that backrest is new and non-obvious addition uh, over, over my patent, right? So he gets he gets a patent on that. So now I have a patent on a stool. I can prevent him from making, using, selling a stool. And he can prevent me from making, using, and selling a chair. Hopefully that makes sense. So I have a question for the group. Who can sell the chair? Anybody? That's Scott. Actually, no. Good guess, but nobody can sell the chair. If I sell the chair, he can sue me for, for patent infringement, right? Because he has a patent on the chair. If Scott sells the chair, I can sue him for infringement on my patent because his chair includes my four legs and my seat, right? So just because he got a patent on the chair doesn't mean he can actually make, use, and sell that chair. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> and so that's where cross-licensing sort of comes into play. And that's why it's important to understand the differences between patentability and freedom to operate. As again, these are these are very uh, separate things, but but often have very overlapping analyses. Um, and feel, if anyone has questions, feel free to jump in. Hopefully, that made sense. Um, speaking of FTO, this is often a very hot topic um, for our clients, especially early stage who, who might be getting into raising funds and. And those investors uh, you know, are interested in, well, can you even commercialize this device without stepping on someone else's uh, patent toes, if you will? And so the level of FTO, there's, there's so many variations of this, um, of the analysis. It can get very cumbersome, can get very expensive. Um, so it's often best to take it. Sort of, um, <laughs> sort of step by step. Um, I'd say if you're, if you're very early, let's say you're raising your, your first round of funding, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think at the very least, you wanna be able to speak to at least the prior art and all the cited references you've seen in, in the prosecution of your patent application. So let's say you've been prosecuting a patent portfolio and there's art that's come about, at least be knowledgeable on that art with respect to whether any of it could, could pose a freedom to operate concern. So if any of that art is actually issued patents, you know, know about the claims and be able to articulate why, why that's not a concern. Um, I think that's probably a good level early on. And then you can definitely expand on that um, as you get further down the load by, by, you know, examining competitor patent portfolios, doing keyword searching and really flushing out um, the landscape on, on the features of your product that you want to clear. I'll just jump, jump in there. So a couple of reasons why we, we sort of frame that as here, here's a reasonable level to think about when you're at that early stage, that sort of first, first round of, of financing, say, uh, where somebody's going to, they're going to give you money, but they're going to do some diligence. That's the lowest hanging fruit for anybody like us who we do a lot of diligence for investors. The easiest, cheapest, fastest thing they just go to is, well, what about the prior art that's been cited against them? Just have a look at that. So it, it, it's almost expect that somebody will look at that if nothing else. And so you just want to have been there first and you know what the answer is. And hopefully there are no problems there. Um, it, it's also you know, from your side of the table, it's an, it's an easy, cheap place to look because somebody else essentially did the legwork. An examiner went out there, scrounged around in the prior art, found things. So, you know, the, it, all the, although it's done for patentability, not FTO, there's overlap. So take advantage of that work. And, and you, you don't, didn't have to go out and look for that. You, you paid a patent examiner and they did that work for you. So that, that's usually a, a good place to start. And then later you can get into more, as Jeremy said. All right, uh, we'll touch on FTO a little bit further um, later in the presentation as well. All right, so turning to ownership, you wanna ensure you own everything, 
<laughs> or at least sufficient rights, you know, whether that's outright ownership or, or a license or exclusive license or whatnot. Um, of course, your, your technology is a critical asset that must be protected uh, from the start. That's for why we're here. Um, by default, inventors own their inventions unless they agree otherwise. And they almost always agree otherwise, whether they know it or not. So uh, let's say you start a company. Everyone who does work for your company should enter into an agreement uh, that the company will own their inventions before they start work with the company, before they start inventing. Um, very important. Uh, you may have come across these PIAs or CIAs. Excuse me. These are proprietary or confidential information and invention assignment agreements uh, for employees. And it's always a good idea to have have an attorney take a look to make sure the provision, all, all the right provisions are in there and they use the right language, um, which has changed over the years. Uh, and, and there's some bullet points on some things to consider, you know, there would be a carve out for pre-employment inventions to make that very clear cut on, on you know, when that person invented that thing and, and thereby, you know, who was their employer at the time, what were their assignment obligations at that time, so you can figure out who, who actually owns it. Um, there's typically a non-disclosure agreement, and then you, know, you may also include some non-compete, non-solicitation clauses, depending on the circumstances. If sitting here today, you're like, oh, well, my company doesn't have any PIAs in place with all my employees, do it now. It's worth doing now. Um, it's, it's sort of as, <laughs> as soon as you can. These things get, get much more complicated down the road, um, especially as you, know, you have turnover within your company, employees start leaving. It's, it's, really good to get it done um, and shore up the right documents uh, as soon as possible. Some sort of different types of uh, employees to consider, consultants, contractors. Uh, it's also important to get agreements in place with an assignment, uh, invention assignment agreement or provisions, um, not only confidentiality with those folks. Um, consider you know, a consultant or contractor likely has an agreement with their employer. So it's important to, to understand and get the sort of chain of title uh, completed properly. So there's likely an agreement between you know, that person doing the work, their employer, um, and then your company with the employer. So it's, it's important to understand sort of how the rights flow and, and to get that right. Uh, doctors and professors, uh, this is where we sort of see, see a lot of the issues because they often have concurrent or prior obligations to, to hospitals or university systems. Um, undergrad students as well, although it's usually le less of a concern for them. But again, it depends on, uh, very much depends on the university um, and the type of work folks are doing. Um, of course, if, if, if we're talking about a, an invention from a doctor or professor you know, trying to spin out a company, often the, the invention is owned uh, by that hospital or university system and may need to be licensed. So it's important to, to understand that um, and get clarity on the scope of assignment obligation. So some some factors that usually weigh in on, on where the rights uh, lie is, you know, the, whether you're using hospital university resources, whether you're doing your work on their time, um, whether developments you're making are sort of made in the field of research you're sort of employed to be working within. Um, and then sort of remedies is you may want to seek a release or confirmation that the work for your company um, is not subject to an assignment obligation to that hospital or, or university system. And as Scott mentioned, we. We do a lot of diligence work, and I mean, this is this is where we go first. We're always looking at ownership issues. We see some relationship with prior employers or doctors and professors with university systems, um, hospital systems. This is where we, we see most issues. So uh, it's good to deal with this, um, especially early. Prior employees as well uh, may have rights, so it's important to to diligence that person before before you bring someone into the company. Um, Myself and Scott have dealt with this many times, and we've had to enter you know, days and days of interviews of, of employees to figure out <laughs> when they invented what, when they were doing the work, um, even even before being able to, to, to start the company that our client wanted to start. So it can get very it can get very uh, cumbersome. So it's good to understand that um, in you know accurate detail. And that can also overlap into uh, into non compete obligations as well uh, and and that's uh, you know a lot of times people will be looking at it from the non-compete perspective but but those employees all those those former employers also have rights to because they have PIAAs with those uh, employees and that say hey you we own everything you invent while you're with us so if you hire somebody out of a similarly out of a company in a similar space 
and and you know a month after they're with you their name shows up on a patent application with your company the, the default assumption by that prior employer is they must have invented that while they were with me not enough time has passed and then um th that can become a real risk issue for you so we try and make sure that's cleaned up at the get-go mm -hmm. so founders in particular so if a founder comes up with an idea for a company while working at their former employer that former employer may actually own the foundational IP for your company. Right? So that can be very problematic. Um, founder, for example, may be covered by non-disclosure, non-compete or non-solicitation obligation, as Scott just alluded to, um, which might even impede you know, or prevent execution of that new company before you even really get started. Technical employees, similar issues, uh, depending on, on what you're hiring them to do, how similar um, to what they did at their prior employer. And some of the factors I mentioned on the previous slide come into play there. So a uh, well, concrete step, be sure to get copies of and, and carefully review all the employment agreements, PIAs and non-competes for every single founder and every employee or company, right? It's important to actually get copies of those documents um, and sort of hang on to them because those will come into play. Uh, well, well, one for your understanding and then those will, you know, if you ever do a diligence or, or your fundraising, um, folks on the other side will wanna see copies of those. It's important to be organized on that front. Um, and yeah, uh, as the next bullet point says, it's important to get it right from the beginning um, instead of trying to fix it when it's time critical, right? That often we're fixing things when, when a deal's trying to close, it's sort of the wee hours of the night and it can get pretty messy. Um, and of course, with, with turnover in early stage companies, often em employees leave maybe on not so great terms and you know, searching for them again and agree to sign documents uh, at that point can be very problematic and, and difficult. So it's good to do it uh, when they come in the door. And just a, a very short war story. I had an act, a, a strategic acquiring a client of ours uh, that we, we we went out there at the, the beginning for them. Uh, $100 million acquisition almost came off the rails over an ownership issue with the university that one of the founders had been involved with uh, and, and try on, sh on a short time fuse to get a, any any university to address the issue and give you a release and, and confirm that no that 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 what that professor was doing and you know, we don't we don't own that stuff he was doing it on his own time etc so that it was a it was a very dicey thing to get, end up getting that deal done and lots of representations and escrowed you know portions of the sale proofs, proceeds and everything to to manage that risk and as something if done early could, could have just been been solved uh, without a, a big deal. All right, so now that you own everything, we'll switch gears to pursuing patent protection. Uh, so as you may or may not be aware, the, the world is sort of now uh, aligned under this first to file system uh, rather than a first to invent. Um, so it's important to, to timely file and, and here's some things to consider. Right? You, wanna, you wanna file before any non-confidential disclosure. And in fact, any non-confidential disclosure of your technology can, can compromise protection, um, especially outside of, of the US. Outside of the US, uh, almost every country has, or maybe all every country has an absolute novelty requirement. So the second you have sort of a non-confidential disclosure, rights are gone, can't foreign file. In the US, there's a little more wiggle room. You have up to a year, um, but again, it's uh, the conservative approach is always to file before any, any non-confidential disclosure. Um, some examples of such a disclosure, presentation at conferences, trade shows, journal articles, um, product testing or release that's you know, folks are not under an NDA, um, discussions with potential investors, KOLs uh, and the like. Um, so always always good to, to question and consult with, a, with the appropriate people, maybe a patent attorney before, um, you know, if you have any, any question uh, or concern on whether, you know, particular uh, disclosure would, would be deemed non-confidential or, or public. So when to file? Uh, if you can answer these, if you can answer yes to these, these next three bullet points, your invention is probably right for patenting. Um, do you know what your invention is? Can, can you articulate it? Uh, do you know how to make it work? Is it just sort of this abstract uh, concept or inventive broad concept? Or have you actually figured out how to do it, reduce it to practice, uh, if you will? Um, and then, do you know suitable alternatives? Uh, we'll get into a, a little bit later why that's that's important. But again, it, if you feel like the answer is yes to those, it's probably time um, to get an application on the file. Also, uh, consider when you anticipate entering the market. Right. So, patent procurement 
can take many years. It's a multi-year uh, procurement process. There are options to go faster, um, especially in the US, it's more of a sort of a pay to play thing, but even under you know, the fastest option, it's still gonna take about a year. Um, so consider that. And you know, it's good to have patents issued by the time, by the time you get to get to market. Um, and in medtech, as I'm sure you're all aware, market entry is often gated by regulatory approvals, right? C marks and PMA. So it's important to keep keep aligned uh, the timelines, or at least keep the timelines in mind. Um, the, the regulatory and patent, patent patent timelines. Uh, Jeremy, we have a question. Oh, awesome. Yes. Um, so uh, Linda's asking, does uh, does presenting the work at a staff meeting or internal function count as disclosure? I assume that's an that's an internal discussion, sort of with, within the company. Yeah. So any any discussion right. within the confines of the company is is fine. fine. Not yeah. a problem. You're really worried about disclosure out, outside of the company. And and if there's a need to go outside of the company, then you it, you need to have an NDA in place, uh, or now you're at risk. Right. All right. You may have seen these terms thrown around. You you, you may know what they are. There's so what patent application to file? There's provisional patent applications and non-provisional patent applications. Um, and we'll get, we'll get to some more strategy behind them uh, on some later slides, but, but what are they? So provisional patent application, it's never examined. So you don't need to file with claims, uh, which makes it a, a little easier and a little less expensive uh, to prepare. It doesn't itself mature into a patent. It actually goes abandoned at, at 12 months um, from its filing date as a matter of law but can be converted into, into the non-provisional application, which I'll get into. Um, its specification uh, must fully support all aspects of your invention. So keep in mind, it's not to be viewed as sort of this, this cheap, quick and dirty filing placeholder um, outside of any you know, unusual circumstances. Like if you have to present it at you know, a conference tomorrow, yeah, maybe we'll end up filing uh, your slide deck just out of abundance of caution, but, but it's only worth what it discloses. So, so keep that in mind. Um, Scott and I, I think both agree. We, we typically like to think of, uh, you know, a good provisional application looks no different than a non-provisional aside from not having the claims, but, um, but, you know, it'll come down to sort of budget and, and things of that nature and, and how far along you are with, with your development process and, and sort of likelihood of, of things changing down the road as far as product design. Um, so those are some factors to consider and we'll get into some more later. Non-provisional patent applications. These are these are the applications that are examined uh, by the patent office, um, and if patentable, this is what matures into a non-provisional or what's called a utility patent. Um, patent term I mentioned earlier is twenty years, and it runs from uh, your, the filing date of your non-provisional. So, if you file a provisional um, and then a year later you convert to a non-provisional, you effectively sort of get a free year, um, if you will. It doesn't cut into your term. Uh, of your patent. So, so that's one nice feature of the provisional. Again, the disclosure must fully support all aspects of your invention. Um, and in this case, it, it'll be your claimed invention. It'll be what's actually in the claims. Um, and then continuing cases uh, are called, or continuing non-provisionals. Uh, there's three different types. There's continuation, continuation part, and, and divisional. Um, happy to get into and, those. And, and I would yeah. encourage you whenever somebody says continuation in part, you should just be suspicious. <laughs> they're, they're wildly overused. It's a, it's a way to, it, the, the notion is, well, I have some incremental content. I have some more disclosure. I would like to put that in. I want to tie it back to my earlier case. Most of the time, it's not the right answer. The right answer is to file a new case, start, start afresh in, in part because of that. You know, I could start a new 20 year clock running for, for term. And in the med tech world, you know, not quite as much as the big pharma world, but still the, the out years are usually the important ones because the timelines to commercialization are so long that, that term matters. When strategic acquires you 10 years after you founded the company, they'd like to see, you know, 10, 15 years left on, on the life of patents, not, not two years. So be, be skeptical anytime somebody's talking to you about you should do a CIP or a continuation in part. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, international protection. So all patents are territorial, right? They protect the individual countries. Um, there are treaty regimes that give credit in other countries for a US filing date, uh, but you have to take that step you know, within the 12 months from your first filing. And there's two treaties, the Paris Convention, which allows you 
to sort of utilize your US filing and go straight into a foreign country of interest. We maybe use that 1% of the time. Most often we use the, the, the next treaty, the Patent Cooperation Treaty or PCT, um, because that basically gives you an 18 month window before having to enter uh, individual countries. So it's sort of a placeholder in that regard. Um, and it also gives you a non-binding patentability search or evaluation. So an actual examiner will pick up your case and evaluate it. Um, it kind of gives you uh, some non-binding insight into, into what art is out there. Um, so if you file your provisional application uh, and then 12 months later, you file your PCT application and you utilize that whole 18 months, that gives you 30 months um, before you actually have to do any foreign filing and you preserve that, that, that 30 month prior a filing date um, across all your applications. And, um, so and that PCT so is, can also be a vehicle for a U.S. non-provisional filing as well. Yeah. So you can go provisional, one single PCT application, 18 months later, you can go into not just foreign countries, but come back into the U.S. and U.S. Non a U.S. non-provisional. So that's if you really want to push out timelines, push out the spend, defer the spend as long as possible, you can even do it for the U.S. And, and there's reasons why you might want to do that. And then other reasons are sometimes, and, and we often will say, Let, let's jump more quickly into the U.S. and then even go fast track and get you something issued quickly in the U.S. while you defer the costs for foreign while keeping options open. Right. And that's because foreign filing is very expensive. Um, so, you know, and of course, that's very impactful for early stage companies. So the more you can push out that spend, Scott mentioned, uh, typically the better while preserving rights. So you preserve all the rights, right, as if you were to form file initially, but, but it buys you that time. Um, and because it's so expensive, even when you do get to that point where you decide where to form file, you really want to align yourself with the markets that you plan to enter, right? Where would you potentially want protection? Where would you want to enforce uh, your patents and, and what markets? Um, it's not going to be everywhere. Uh, it's just too expensive and, and not practical. Um, if you don't know where you're going to enter, consider, uh, if you do or even if you don't, consider where uh, potential strategic acquirers like to file. So let's say you can envision you know, being acquired by an Edwards. We'll look to see where they file. Um, typically a handful of countries that we see for medtech companies um, that are of interest to, to, most, uh, to most companies. Um, but that can give you some insight, even if, you know, potentially it's a market you don't plan to enter. Well, if, if you know, one of your investors or, or strategic acquirers plans that to that market, then, then it might be worthwhile getting something on file there. And, and I'll just jump in there just, just for a, a reference point. So we do this a, a lot. I have done this many, many times for companies. Here we go through the where are the strategics filing. Uh, you, you, and we'll look at, you know, well, so it's, it's Edwards and Abbott. Uh, and Boston Scientific, let's get a current read on their footprint for that specific area of taking those prosthetic heart valves. Where are they actually filing? And time and again, we do this. We go look at public databases, where have they filed over the last five years? I can tell you every time it comes back to the first place that they file is Europe, the next place that they file is Japan, then China, then Australia and Canada, and then a long tail after that, but a big drop off. So you, you should really think hard about, is there any reason why you're filing in any more than those five countries? Uh, and a lot of times the right answer is it just just do Europe, do US and Europe. Um, and, and maybe you go further than that. The earlier applications tend to be the more important ones. You tend to go broader. So it's also, it's not one size fits all. File your broadest, most earliest, broadest, most important cases, file those most broadly. Your later ap later applications are likely in more incremental improvements and you may just, you may just do Europe. Um, uh, having put a stake in the ground in, in the other markets with your first case. And even then, doing that five-country footprint, you're talking fifty thousand dollars, sort of out of the you know, thirty to fifty, depending on how, how big, bulky your application is, to just get that initial filing done in each of those countries, and now you start a pipeline of expense for actual prosecution. Mm -hmm. And again, as mentioned before, just to reinforce non-confidential disclosures, uh, can you know before your first pat patent filing can lose can lose you all foreign rights. So we had something to really keep in mind. All right, file applications right. Here's sort of uh, our tips from, from all of our, our lessons learned. Um, as Scott just mentioned, your first uh, patent application filing is usually your most important, right? It'll be the foundation of your portfolio. Important to do it right, uh, more so than others. Um, some things to think about. Don't just focus on your current design, uh, right? So don't just drop in your, your prototype drawings and just be sort of narrow-minded in that, in that sense and say, I figured it out. 
here patent attorney uh, draft application based on these figures in this description. The way we approach it, and, and we like to think it's one of the better ways is to really abstract out your invention to a functional block diagram. And I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like. Um, and this is really the level at which you wanna end up framing your broadest claims, right? So if you really think about uh, abstracting out sort of the, the true inventive concepts that you've come up with um, you know, from a functional perspective, uh, you can capture those. Uh, you'll set yourself up nicely to then go on and describe sort of each particular embodiment and map those back to the block diagram um, and, and describe how each embodiment sort of implements uh, each block. Right, so, uh, and, and when you're describing those embodiments, you want to dis consider disclosing other earlier designs that maybe you decided weren't, weren't very good, um, but they might be competitive alternatives, right? And you might come back to those down the road and say, actually, that, that was a good idea, even though we sort of decided to go down a different path. Um, and even if you don't, you can, you can deny those to others, right? Others who, who may try and go down that way. Um, and then always be thinking about alternatives to your design. So when you're looking at the, the block diagram, for example, uh, think about what are all the ways I could implement each component function um, here. Uh, so hopefully that'll make more sense uh, on the next slide. Um, and then always build enough time to, 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 to prepare the application right before you need it on file. All right, a week or two is not enough for a good application. Um, and uh, I promise you this is an unbiased opinion. Don't do it yourself. <laughs> it, it's a rare inventor who can write uh, a good patent. I mean, that said, a good invention disclosure package is invaluable uh, for your patent attorney. So it can, it can greatly improve the quality of the ultimate application. Um, it can considerably cut down on, on the time and expense uh, in preparing it. So sort of the better information and the more information we get, uh, the better and less expensive the application will be. So, Here's an idea, here's an example application. Um, on the left is, is the functional block diagram and on the right is a specific embodiment that, that implements those blocks. Um, this is a transeptal, uh, a delivery device, device and transeptal puncture device. So this long piece here is, is a shaft that, that can go in and span um, the IVC, SVC. And then we have what we call this, this guide side catheter guy that, that goes in straight and then is able, once you're in there, to deflect um, and turn towards the septum. And then nested within there, you can't see here, is some other components, including a needle that can then extend out and, and puncture the septum. Um, you probably wouldn't be able to uh, uh, get there by just looking at this block diagram. Um, but, uh, well, I guess one way to, to convey the importance here, our client's commercial device doesn't really look like this anymore, but the claims we drafted um, that are that are sort of more in line and, and covered by uh, this sort of broader schematic diagram cover their their sort of design change, right? Their, their new commercial embodiment. So that's why it's really important to, to really abstract out the main concepts and not focus on just your specific design at that time. So think about you know, all the different way all the different ways or, or things that could be used for the main shaft. Uh, what could the guide cup? Uh, what could the uh, side catheter guide look like? How could it be coupled to the main shaft? All different, different sort of iterations of that you want to consider um, early on because it, it's very, very rare that uh, when we first engage with a client and learn about their their technology and their product that their actual product two years later looks anything like that. You know their first design and what we filed on. Um, and we're always going back to that first filed application and trying to figure out a way we can use that disclosure to cover you know, their current embodiment or commercial device. So really important to put the effort in up front. Yep. All right. Um, file patents, right? So back to the, the provisional, it's usually best um, outside of you know, certain circumstances to file your provisional. It's just start with a provisional first. It gives you that year to supplement and evolve on the disclosure as you refine, refine your, 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 um, your product. Um, of course, each incremental filing gets sort of a new filing date, but, um, but it presents a lot, of, a lot of options. So you can file as many provisionals as you want during that year, and you can roll them all into a single non-provisional at the end of the year. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's very efficient and economical approach. Um, and it allows you to take advantage, sort of optimize, or yeah, take advantage of the first to file system, right? You're able to file earlier and more often by, by filing these provisionals. Um, as I mentioned before, the term of the eventual patent is not impacted by, uh, by the provisional. So it sort of gets you that sort of free year. Um, again, allow enough lead time to prepare the non-provisional. So if you file your provisional, uh, hopefully you're staying in, in constant contact with, with your um, uh, patent attorney, but you don't want to show up, you know, two weeks before that 12 month anniversary date and say, okay, we're, here's all this new disclosure. Here's how we've changed our design. I'm ready to file a non-provisional. Um, and I think we often see this, especially with, with patents that are sort of being uh, drafted and prosecuted out of university systems. So maybe you haven't shored up the exclusive license or whatnot. And, and, you know, the, the tech transfer office within the university is handling the prosecution. Um, and they may not be staying on top of the dates uh, as much as as they should, because you know maybe it's not top of mind technology, right? As opposed to how you would be handling it, or 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 a patent attorney would be handling it for a specific uh, company. Um, here's sort of a, a nuance point, but so, so we I mean we often like to say you know just as I mentioned on the previous slide, you want to be thinking about all the different. Uh, all the different versions of your invention that you thought about. And so you, you, you might be tempted to sort of do like a data dump and throw everything you ever thought of in the patent application. One counterpoint there, any discussion of ideas that you won't be able to fully flesh out during that one year period. So say you, you file everything in a provisional application and you have this one idea, you're probably not gonna work on it again for another three years, sort of this adjacent idea, um, but you mention it in your provisional and then it gets, and then it gets converted into the non-provisional. That non-provisional, unlike a provisional, will publish. And when that publishes, you know, the, the provisional effect, the content of the provisional effectively publishes. Um, so what you said in that can become prior art against you. So let's say you file a provisional, you convert to a non-provisional, then you pick up that idea three or four years later and you decide to file a new patent application on it. That earlier disclosure uh, could, could come back to bite you, right? It'll be prior art at the level it's described. I mean, hopefully you've, You've got more detail since then. Um, that would, you know, it would be material and patentable over that earlier disclosure. But, but if you know you're not going to be um, developing it, it's probably best to leave it out. And as Scott alluded to earlier, there's a go fast option um, in the track in, in the U.S. It's called Track One or Fast Track Filing, um, and that's a two thousand dollar incremental fee at the Patent Office. It gets you two rounds with an examiner within a year. Um, so. I mean, you, you can get to a, an issued patent you know, within a year's time or, or a little bit more. Um, and often our strategy here is we're trying to get, we want to go fast, trying to get some, some meaningful coverage on our product. Doesn't have to be the broadest coverage. Um, so we usually suggest going a little narrower um, to get that first stake in the ground. And then you can always file continuation applications and sort of push the patentability boundary. Um, but and we often recommend this approach. It, it, the incremental cost is is modest of this 2K. You are pulling forward the, the, the expense of the back and forth negotiation with the patent examiner. But we have just seen time and again that this can be very helpful. Instead of saying, I have a pending patent application that'll get picked up in two years when you're out trying to raise your first, first round of institutional financing and say, I've got two issued patents that are applicable to my product and a continuation uh, it, you know, in the hopper to go back after the broader claims. It, it makes a big difference in the, in the IP diligence uh, part of, a, of an investment round. Uh, so it, it, we, we have seen it be very, very useful um, and well worth the money. All right. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, the sort of patent application is all about the claims, right? So you want to claim it right. The, pertinent, the, the purpose of the patent is the claims. They define the boundaries uh, that you can prevent others from crossing. Uh, so here are various approaches to claims that you want to consider, not necessarily all in one application, but you know, across uh, several applications over time. Method of treatment um, can be very valuable in the U.S. Note that methods of, of medical treatment are not permitted in, in most foreign countries and, and the ones we care about. Typically, they're, they're not allowed. Um, so we typically only pursue those in the U.S. And of course, we don't want to be, most of our clients don't want to be in the business of suing docs. Uh, but the, you know, your competitors who, who make the devices uh, that those 
those doctors use uh, in their procedures will have liability. So that's sort of the thinking behind method claims. Device claims, um, some things to think about. Uh, covering consumables and disposables, the, that can often be where the money is um, and you can deny competitors the opportunity to sell them. So you when, you're, when you're crafting claims, you really wanna think about what's the device that's gonna hit the market and in what form. Um, and that's where kit claims can come into play. So what's in the package that the user, the end user is, is opening um, and does it need assembly? And is it gonna be sourced from sort of different entities or is it a single, you know, a single entity providing that, that component? Um, often it, it, it's much cleaner and it's ideal in, in most circumstances to you know, craft a claim that could be infringed by a single entity. It, it's just easier to, to sue one entity. Um, so you wanna be very thoughtful there. And then consider whether any software is involved. Um, you can cover that with methods or machine readable medium or program processor and stuff of that nature. So there, you can sort of come at your technology from, from various angles. You wanna be thoughtful in that regard. And this may be one of the most important, uh, one of the most important slides, especially with your sort of uh, setting up a patent program. Um, so once you have ownership shored up, uh, I'd say this is probably the, the next most important. You want to make sure you're covering your key product, right, and your key features and key markets. So you want to make sure that your IP, your IP plan, your patent portfolio strategy is always aligned with your business um, and is, is sort of paralleling your R and D plan. Um, as I mentioned before. Companies often end up with a product that looks nothing like the product they started with. Um, it's almost always the case. So it's important to keep patent filings up to date uh, on any likely commercial candidates, keeping your patent attorney up to date on these things. Um, and to help with that, you can have uh, periodic IP reviews. Um, as I sort of alluded to, it's a dynamic process. Um, a lot of our clients will set up monthly invention disclosure, download meetings, either internally or with us or both. Um, and then it's good to sort of have periodic uh, reviews of, of your patent portfolio and applications to ensure all your key features are covered, the claim strategies you're going after are meaningful, um, and then uh, often it's good to understand what your competitors are doing. All right, so key takeaways. Um, hopefully I drove this home on ownership, the importance of ownership. Uh, I want to make sure all your, you know, every employee signs a PIA, every consultant signs an agreement with an IP assignment provision with, with, with the appropriate language. Not all provisions sort of are up to date with, with the right language um, before they start work. Conduct diligence on, on past employment um, for anyone you hire. Uh, make sure you're securing rights uh, necessary to, uh, you know, to pursue the IP. Um, that, that sort of covers your, your sort of, you know, the, your technology um, that may be owned by a hospital or university, get clarity on ownership of inventions, um, you know, going forward. So if, if doctor or professor is involved in a spin out, understand what were their prior obligations and what are their obligations going forward? And are those going to change? You want to carve, carve that out. Um, foundational IP patent filings. As we just talked about, you want to get your first applications done right, time. Again, don't have this sort of tunnel vision on your current design. Really sort of abstract out the, the inventive principles and think about what are the most important concepts and what are all the ways we can implement those, even if they're subpar. Um, and, and yeah, take a hard look at existing filings to identify any issues and enhance with follow-on filings. So just, again, staying aligned uh, with, with sort of product development on the IP front so you can adjust accordingly. Um, and yeah, and I think uh, as you're developing your program, always your patent program should always be able to, uh, especially if you're dealing with, with fundraising or, or talking to others in, in the industry, um, even if you don't have an issued patent, try to be able to articulate sort of your expected patent coverage based on sort of your knowledge of, of the industry and the prior art, um, also sometimes called the white space. like. If we don't have a patent yet, what do we think we could get? And maybe you have a first office action with an examiner with the patent office um, and they present some prior art and you've identified ways you could overcome that. Even though you haven't yet, you can articulate that, um, you know, especially if, if someone on the other side is sort of a sophisticated patent person, they'll get it, right? Even they don't necessarily need to see an issued patent all the time. 
as long as they understand sort of where things lie. Um, and then again, as we mentioned before, that the freedom to operate FTO, um, sort of always keep it in mind that and think about what is the right level that's commensurate with, with the company stage. And obviously that changes as, as the company further develops. So that's all I have as far as slides. Um, happy to backtrack on any of those topics, um, answer any questions. Did I put you to sleep? Hopefully I didn't turn Peter <laughs> off from uh, I do a, have a career. <laughs> I, I, do, I do have a question. This one looks for Jeremy or Scott. What happens if you, if you were working for a company but this company works for a different industry in which you have filed a patent. For example, one industry could be the aerospace uh, industry or automotive industry, and you have filed a patent and a company within the medical sciences industry, in this case, the medical device. Would that be considered ownership under the automotive company or the aerospace company? You ready for this? Here's the lawyer's answer. It depends. Um, so, so what you'd have to do is look at your PIAA or your employment agreement, if that's where they've captured the obligation of assignment and look at how it's framed. Um, usually it's going to be something like that, that is, sounds like anything you invent using resources of the company. So if you're doing it on company time, using company facilities, they own it. Uh, even if you're not, even if you didn't use those the company resources, if it's within sort of the scope of your employment, and this kind of gets to your thing, well, I'm working for an automotive company, but I've invented a medical device. Well, then it would fall outside of, of that piece. So if, if you did it at night or on weekends on your own time, using your own laptop and didn't touch the company's systems at all, and it's, out, it's just different from what you're doing with the company, probably in most cases, you, you, the company doesn't have an ownership doesn't have ownership rights, but you, you got to start with the agreement. And it's also, it's a state law issue. So it's a state by state analysis. Um, so it's, it, it's not always necessarily going to be abundantly clear by looking at the agreement. And, and so you in the end may need to go to a, an employment lawyer or, or a lawyer who's familiar with the employment law in that state and can say, oh yeah, in this state, you know, you're okay. Uh, it's all good. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so yep. much. Navid has a question. Yeah, um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, name's Ari. Um, um, you, you mentioned the um, track one filing, um, and you said something about a um, continuation. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, continuation, right? Um, is there an uh, an extra fee for continuation with the track one filing, or is it like this an all inclusive kind of thing, or? Or is this just fast track only? That's it, and nothing else further. So there's a there's an incremental. So when you file a continuation, it's a whole new filing fee, um, an examination fee. It's sort of independent from the track one. So track one applies to a single application. So if you're to file an application track one, um, and then you decide to file a continuation, then you can decide whether you want to file that continuation track one or not. And you can you can branch that continuation off and file it any time that, that that existing application is pending. Ah, I understand. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, but you have to file the, you have to pay the track one fee for each application you want on the track one path. For each one, okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I think Navid has a question. Yeah, sure, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I have actually two questions. One is uh, maybe I wanna ask, what is the ballpark cost of patent? That's if someone wants to work with your firm. What's the range? Maybe it's a very clear question. And also the second question I want to ask is, if we develop a, an IP in university as a student or join a university as a student, what are the issues we should be careful and uh, is it helps or hurts in general? So, so I'll, I'll do the, let me do the second question uh, first. Okay. So, so it'll depend, right? So, so for undergraduate students, you, sort of the default is universities don't own the IP rights that are created by undergraduate students. It, almost all is university policies say, yeah, no, that's what I should start with. It all depends on what the university's IP policy is. So that's really where you have to start. Undergrad students, I, I don't think I've ever seen any university IP policy that says they, they try and assert ownership on them. Um, it's usually, it's grad students, right? And professors, but for students, it's grad students. And, and I think that I've 
always seen the default be if you're a grad student at the university, they, they will assert ownership to any IP that you develop. But you really just start with what's the university's IP policy. If you have a question, you can go to the tech transfer office and say, hey, um, you know, I would like to understand the parameters or the bounds. Uh, you don't have to go in and say, hey, and then it's a really cool thing. You guys don't own it, right? But, but just understand where they think the line should be drawn. Um, but again, it, it will usually come down to, you know, if it's within the field of your research and or you're doing it in the university's facility in their lab using their equipment, then it's, it's going to be theirs. That'll be their starting point. Um, you, you can you can get releases, even though they own it, you can still go to hey, I've made a disclosure, uh, but I, you know, I'm really interested in this. Are you guys going to do anything? And they may say, yeah, not that interesting. You, you can go do something with it. Um, I'll go back to your first question and I'll start with the lawyer answer. It depends, but we would think in terms of ballpark, if to do a provisional application, and this is just in the med device world, right? Med tech world, kind of that level of complexity and that kind of technology. You can think that a, a solid provisional application, not, not gold plated, not looks just like a non-provisional, but a, a good decent provisional that's worth the filing date. Uh, you can think in the, in the range, you know, something like 10K order of magnitude. Um, and then to do a non-provisional, whether you started from a, a provisional or you start from scratch to do a good non-provisional and again your foundational case you're often looking at something on the order of 25k you know if you did provisional for 10k it may just be an incremental 15k to get to non-provisional assuming you have you don't expand the scope by adding more and that that's just turning time to get the application on file you can usually think about whatever the cost of file is you'll you often spend something like that to get it from there through to issuance uh depending on how many rounds you have to go with the examiner yeah thank you and if i want to have a follow-up on the second question you answered mm -hmm. if we don't use university resources and we just get grants from maybe teaching assistantship and those type of support the company will own the IP, not the university, right? If if you're outside the scope of the university's IP policy, right? So if you say, well, the work that I've just done here, it's not owned by the university, then you go to, well, do I did I enter into a PIAA with the company? You know, so so it starts with you, the inventor owns it, and now did the inventor con contractually obligate themselves to to assign their or did they contractually assign it already to their employer, or to the to the company, right? That they're involved with. But you know, if it's if you're a startup and it's you and you've invented it while you're a student at the university, if you're outside their IP policy, then yes, your company would own it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Great. Any other questions? All right. Well, Jeremy Scott, that was a, that was really really helpful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to share my slides now. Uh, let's see. Stop sharing. Oh, hold on. I'm trying to find. If any of you have any you know, question pops in your mind down the road, feel free to reach out uh, outside of this this presentation. And I think it, and I, I think we the, you know the deck will be available. Our contact yep. information is there. The links are there. Uh, and oh, there you go. That was the, the next point I was going to make. Oh, oh yes. So <laughs> Jeremy and Scott are generously offering uh, office hour sessions uh, next week. Uh, so we have four 30 minute sessions available. Um, it'll be virtual. So let me know. Contact me if you'd like to sign up and the first four people will get these slots. So thank you very much. Um, and then next uh, meetup is coming up in just a few weeks. Um, it's our special holiday happy hour edition. Um, it'll be on December 2nd at 4 p.m. with my friend, uh, Dr. Joelle Lavoie. She is a uh, business development uh, manager in uh, at a, a CAN Health Network in Toronto, Canada. So I hope you can join us. So again, thank you so much, Jeremy and Scott. It was really, really helpful. You're welcome. My pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Scott. Good thank to see you all. Yeah, thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a good Take evening. Care. Thank you. Thank you. Take Hopefully care. we've motivated Peter to uh, keep going down the path toward patent lawyer. It's more fun than that. <laughs> Still got me curious. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it. Well, you also have an invite. If you if you want to reach out and talk about uh, talk about patent law, happy, happy to do that as well. Uh, absolutely. Sure. I'll, I'll definitely be bugging you. All right. Very good. Take thank care, everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Bye, everyone.